action plan. It is 1 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Sonia Dublin. I'm with Capacity for Health, and today's webinar is hosted by Capacity for Health. We're a program of the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum. We're a national organization. We have offices in both San Francisco and D.C. Our Capacity for Health program is based in our San Francisco office, and I will be broadcasting to you today from San Francisco, where it is not raining at the moment, we're very grateful to say. So our program is funded directly by the CDC to provide free trainings and free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and capacity building assistance, primarily to community-based organizations. And today's webinar is part of our monitoring and evaluation series, but we also do work in a really wide array of areas, everything from kind of organizational development, strategic planning, and board development, fund development, to a lot of work around monitoring and evaluation, as well as work trying to support folks in implementing some of the evidence-based interventions and public health strategies that the CDC is specifically disseminating and funding these days. So our services are totally free to end recipients. And we do stuff like these webinars. We also do lots of trainings. And we develop materials. We also work one-on-one -on -one with programs and organizations and staff to help support their program needs. And I'll say a little bit more at the end of today's webinar about how you can access those kinds of services. So before we get started on the content of our webinar, just a few housekeeping announcements. You guys have all been automatically muted as you joined the webinar. We will have opportunities for discussion and for you to ask questions. You can use the hand icon. You'll see that on the right-hand side of your screen attached to your um, all of the kind of keyboard controls you have for the webinar. And you can just click on that hand icon to raise your hand. Then we can actually call on you and unmute you so you can ask your question live. We can only do this, though, if you've entered your audio pin. So if you're hearing your audio through a telephone, you have to make sure to enter your audio pin. Otherwise, we can't actually unmute you. You're also welcome to use the question box to answer questions or to ask questions, rather. If you look on the lower right-hand side of your control panel, you'll see a little box that says questions. You can type into that any questions you have. And we'll be using that feature several times during today's webinar to give you an opportunity to share with us some of your experience in developing evaluation plans or in the evaluation process. We're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. It is a webinar, so that's a little bit challenging. But we really do want to hear from you. And hearing about your experiences helps us to really tailor the content of today's webinar to best meet your needs. So feel free to use either of those question and discussion features. Also, if you have multiple folks watching the webinar around one computer, if you could just chat in using that discussion, using the question box, chat in your contact information. That way we can make sure to include you on our follow-up. We do like to get some feedback from you about how the webinars go and what you like and don't like about them. And we also, for this webinar, have a whole bunch of documents that we're going to be sharing with you at the end of the webinar. So one of them is an information sheet that really captures all the content of today's webinar, so you don't need to take notes on it. We also have some templates that you can use as you're developing your evaluation plan. So we want to make sure that we can send those to everybody who's here on today's webinar. So if you have multiple folks at your computer, just give us your contact information so we can make sure to include you on the follow-up. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded. And this recording will be available after the webinar on our website. So you guys can access it at any point in the future that you'd like. So. Uh, again, my name is Sonia Dublin. I'm a Capacity Building Assistance Specialist with Capacity for Health. I've been working in the field of HIV for a lot longer than I care to admit. And I do a lot of work around monitoring and evaluation. And I always start any of my evaluation work by saying, I want you to forget everything you've ever heard about evaluation. Because I feel like we often come in kind of in the wrong place, thinking about what we have to report on and how to manage it. And it can be really stressful. and feel really intimidating. So I actually think evaluation really is just about learning to do what we do better. And hopefully, at the end of today's webinar, you will have learned a few things that you can do to make this process a little bit more fun for you. So really, our goal today is just to develop our knowledge and skills around developing an organization-wide or program-wide comprehensive evaluation plan. And you'll note that really we're starting with a focus on the evaluation plan. We're not going to be talking about kind of the basics of evaluation. We do have other webinars and other resources that focus on that. And I'll make sure to give you information about how to access those, again, at the end of today's webinar. So by the end of the webinar, we really want you to understand some of the benefits of developing a really comprehensive written evaluation plan, as well as to really be clear about what some sections are to include in that kind of written comprehensive evaluation plan. 
We also want you to develop your skill and your confidence so that you can go back to your programs and your organizations with some really clear strategies and things that you can do to improve and develop a more comprehensive evaluation plans. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about the kind of why and how of evaluation plans. Then we're going to get into really the content, so all the sections that you want to include in a comprehensive evaluation plan. Again, we have some um, documents that we'll share with you at the end of the webinar, so you really don't need to try to capture all of that during the webinar today. We'll make sure to share that with you in a written form so that you can have that moving forward. And then we're going to end um, talking quite a bit about the resources and like I said, we'll have a template, a downloadable template that you can have, as well as you know, really detailed notes from today's webinar. So let's actually start with a little poll. I'd like to know who's on the webinar and what your experience is. You're going to see this poll pop up on your screen. And the question is actually a two-part question. Um, we'd like to know both whether you currently have someone in your organization doing evaluation work and whether or not you have a written evaluation plan. So you'll see the answer choice is no to both, or yes to both, or yes to the evaluation staff, but no plan, yes a plan, but no staff. So I'm going to give you just about 30 seconds to fill out that poll, give me a little bit of a sense of who's on the webinar with us today. This is also part of trying to keep this webinar interactive, so please stay with us. Poll, give us your answers. Let's go ahead and close that out. So it looks like most folks on the webinar have either some evaluation staff or a written plan, but not both. So that's good. We're going to talk a little bit about how to develop a written plan that actually utilizes more than just your evaluation staff. So let's go ahead and move back to the content of today's webinar. I want to actually start with uh, taking a step back and talking a little bit about kind of how we define evaluation and what we consider evaluation. So this is a definition. This is a definition from um, Michael Quinn Patton. Oh, sorry, I hear you're not seeing my screen. Okay. If anyone's having trouble seeing the current screen with the definition of evaluation, please chat in and let us know that. So this is a definition from Michael Quinn Patton. Nope. OK. Sorry about that. We're going to just try this one more time. OK. So definition from Michael Quinn Patton, who's kind of one of the big writers on evaluation in our era and our generation. And so his definition is about the systematic collection of information about activities, characteristics, and outcomes of programs in order to make judgments about the program, improve program effectiveness, and or inform decisions about future programming. I'm going to talk a little bit about this definition. But actually, as I do that, I would like to hear a little bit from you about what your definitions of evaluation are. So if you can use that question feature on the lower right-hand side of your um, tools, your webinar tools, and just tell us, what is evaluation to you? Give us your definition of evaluation. And we're going to share that out so that you guys can see what all of you think about evaluation. So while you're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Quinn Patton's definition. The thing that I really like about what Michael Quinn Patton says is about it being systematic. And I think that we all know that we're in an era of really limited resources. We're constantly having to make decisions about what to do in our programs and our organizations with really limited budgets. And we aren't always very systematic about where we get the information that we use to make those decisions. And we don't always have the time and resources to be as systematic as we want to be. But I think one of the points that Michael Quinn Patton is making about the systematic collection of information is really important. And I think an evaluation plan is one of the ways that we can help ourselves in our programs and in our organizations to be more systematic to get information in more systematic ways in order to help us make those judgments. So I want to share with you one other definition about evaluation. This one is from a discussion board. It's called Eval Talk. It's the discussion board of the American Evaluation Association, the AEA. And this is their definition. What, so what, now what? 
I really love this definition, and I use it a lot when I'm talking to people about evaluation. I think I've mentioned already that in my experience working with folks around evaluation, it's really overwhelming and can be really intimidating for people. And just the word evaluation, there's this whole language around evaluation that people don't always understand, and it can be really confusing. So what I love about this definition is that it really brings us back to that bottom line of what's happening in our programs. That's the what. What's happening? What are the outcomes? What are the results we're seeing for people in our programs? So what? So what does that mean? How do we understand it? How do we put it into context? And really, the key, now what? What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with that information? So I'd like to actually ask you all to kind of keep this definition in mind as we move into talking about the content of evaluation plans. And if any of the language or things we're talking about starts to feel overwhelming or intimidating or confusing or the task of developing a comprehensive evaluation plan starts to feel daunting, I want you guys just to come back to this definition. What, so what, now what? Because fundamentally, that's all we're talking about today. So what is an evaluation plan? It's really just a written document that describes all of your intended evaluation activities. So it's just a way to put in one place what you're planning to do around evaluation for your program, for your organization. Let's do another quick poll just to see who's still with me. I want to know a little bit what you guys think about the benefits of evaluation plans and having a written plan. So this is just a one-part question. You're going to see it come up on your screen. And you can actually select as many of the responses as you like. So which of the following are benefits of an evaluation plan? being more systematic and comprehensive, synthesizing efforts across multiple programs, ensuring relevance and usefulness, increasing buy-in, or lining pet bird and small mammal cages. So again, just going to give you a couple of seconds to give us some responses. Let's go ahead and see what you've said so far. Great. I like that. <laughs> it looks like we're all really on the same page. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits to developing a written evaluation plan, and obviously you guys think that as well, or you wouldn't be here on today's webinar. But the reality of our experience often is that we develop lots of written documents that don't get used. And I think that's what the last um, response category was trying to kind of point out, shred and line to use to line cages for pet birds and small mammals. Hopefully none of us are actually going to do that with our evaluation plans. But um, that is definitely an experience that a lot of us have in terms of developing written reports or written documents and figuring out how to keep those documents useful. So let's talk about some of the other benefits in developing a written evaluation plan. So all of the things that you mentioned or that were on those response categories are benefits for developing an evaluation, a written evaluation plan. It does help us be more systematic. And again, I want to kind of reference back to that Quinn Patton definition that I really like so much about systematic approaches to evaluation. Also, it helps us to synthesize efforts across multiple programs. I think we've all been in situations where we have multiple programs in an organization. We're reporting to multiple different funders with lots of different kinds of performance indicators or different data we're collecting. And how do we synthesize that in a way that helps us to make bigger picture decisions about our organizations and our programs? So that's something that having a written evaluation plan can help us to do, is to be more synthesized or systematic across our programs. Also to ensure relevancy and the usefulness of evaluation, if we have to kind of keep coming back to this document and updating it, making sure we're doing it and using it, I think that helps us to keep our evaluation activities really useful. The process of developing the plan itself can help to increase staff and stakeholder buy-in. In just a minute, we're going to talk about kind of the first step, which is actually about identifying stakeholders. And the more we have people participate in developing the plan and the more we share that plan with people, the more we actually create a whole culture of buy-in around engaging in evaluation and thinking about what's working or not working in our programs. Um, in addition to that, it helps us to stick to our plan. So it's kind of a, a task list of what we need to do, and it can help us to keep on task and make sure we are doing what we set out to do, what we want to be doing. And finally, the document itself can be shared with our funders, with our community members, with staff and other organizations, our collaborators. And just the existence of the plan itself really helps to demonstrate to folks that 
we're committed to understanding what's working and not working in our programs. We're committed to engaging in an evaluation process. So let's talk about the content of the plan. I want to share with you first, this is the CDC's framework for program evaluation, and this is really the basis of the content that we're going to be talking about in terms of what to include in the evaluation plan. So as you can see, they have this sort of um, cycle, and I actually put the numbers in the steps here. So their, their evaluation framework is really very cyclical, in fact, very iterative. But just for the sake of talking through it, we'll just kind of start with number one. You can see that you sort of work your way through engaging stakeholders, describing the program, focusing the evaluation, gathering the data, analyzing it or justifying conclusions, and then making sure that that gets shared and used in ways that are meaningful. So that's the CDC's framework for program evaluation. You can see that on the left of your screen now. And on the right are the nine sections that we think are important to include in a written comprehensive evaluation plan. So the six that are in bold, you can see, are literally the six steps of the CDC's framework for program evaluation. And then we've added an introduction and a work plan and appendix kind of to tie it all together. So we're going to talk through these sections, the description of the program, engaging stakeholders, focusing evaluation, gathering data, doing analysis, and then using those results. And that's really the core and the heart of what we're going to talk about today in terms of evaluation plans. The first section, the introduction, is really a very, very brief couple of paragraphs that help to orient your reader. So you might be sharing the evaluation plan with your staff, with your funders, with other organizations, with community members, and you want to make sure that you just kind of set a little bit of a foundation for them to understand kind of what it is that you're going to be doing in the plan itself. Just as a reminder, we're going to give you all this information at the end of this webinar. We're going to give it to you in a Word document so that you have both a template that you can use for developing a plan as well as a summary of all of this content today. So you don't need to worry about capturing it all as we talk through it. But the first section, the introduction, in addition to kind of orienting your reader, is really where you can just talk a little bit about your goal for this evaluation. What is it that you're wanting to learn or understand in your evaluation? Why are you doing the evaluation? And why are you doing the evaluation right now? What is it about this moment in time or this evaluation? And then a little bit about who your team is, who's going to be involved in the evaluation process. So again, this is just a really short section, a couple of paragraphs at the beginning of your document. The next section, the program description, again, is really about setting some context for your reader, especially for readers who don't know your program very well. A lot of what's contained in this section, you probably aren't going to need to develop for your evaluation plan. It's probably stuff that has been developed in grant applications, in other kinds of program documents. So hopefully you can cut and paste some of those sections into your evaluation plan so that it orients your reader without having to like reinvent the wheel of redeveloping all of it. So you want to say a little bit about the history of your program, the population you're working with, the need in the community that you're trying to address. Hopefully you have some goals and some objectives. You'll notice here that I talk about SMART objectives. So um, SMART objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. And we actually have a whole webinar about developing SMART objectives, if that's something that you want some more support on. But if you have goals and objectives that have been developed for your program as part of grant applications or part of other program documents, this is a great place to include some of those to kind of orient your reader about what it is you're doing in your program. You might want to include something about the resources that are available. That could be your staff. That could be your funding. It could be your geographic reach in terms of where you're operating. You might want to include just a little bit more of a description of your activities, exactly what is it that your program is doing or that you're engaging in, and something about your intended long-term outcomes. And again, that really all helps to kind of frame the evaluation for your reader. And as they move into the next section, which is where we get into more of the kind of heart of the evaluation activities, it helps to give folks a perspective about kind of where this evaluation sits in the context of the work you're doing. So sections three through six of your evaluation plan are really the heart of all of your activities. It's kind of the who, what, why, and how of your evaluation. As the most substantive sections of the plan, these sections should really be as long as necessary to cover all of the questions that we're going to go through in the next few slides. So the first section, your introduction, just a paragraph or two. The program description, two or three paragraphs, maybe a little bit more if you have a very large or complex program. But here's where you really start getting into kind of the volume of your evaluation plan. 
And these are sections three through six, engaging your stakeholders. So that's really the who. Who is it who's going to be involved in the evaluation effort? Focusing the evaluation, that's kind of the bigger macro picture, sort of our framework, our approach to evaluation, the design, the type of evaluation. And then specifically evaluation questions. And step section five, the evidence. So how are we going to gather this information? What are our methods? What are our specific tools? And then section six is the analysis. How are we going to make sense of it? So again, if you think back to that eval talk definition, the, the what, the what, now what, this is really kind of the heart of the, the what, what are we learning, that's kind of the method. So, so what, what does it mean, that's the analysis, and then then what. So let's talk first about engaging stakeholders. So this section, section three, is really the who. It's about defining who's going to be involved in the evaluation effort. And a stakeholder can really be anybody who has an interest in the program. It could be the staff of our programs, the community members, the participants or the clients in our programs, even our funders and our board members. They have a vested interest in what we do and in understanding it and in improving it. So we really encourage folks to define their stakeholders broadly. And the most successful and meaningful evaluations often really require the participation of a broad range of people. I think we've all had the experience of developing this great survey and then realizing that our funder wants some piece of information that we didn't include in the survey. Or we design this great survey and our clients think it sucks. Or they just don't understand the language that we use. So really involving a broad range of participants in the whole evaluation process, it can really help us to create evaluation that is more meaningful, that is more useful, and that really meets the needs of our kind of the whole range of people who's invested in our program. So this section of the evaluation plan is going to sort of define who those stakeholders are and then specifically lay out what role they're going to play in the evaluation and really how we're going to keep them engaged in the evaluation. So how are we going to connect with them? How are we going to solicit their input or their engagement? So this is probably just a couple of paragraphs, who they are and what their role in the evaluation process is, how we're going to keep them engaged. So we're going to take a minute now and actually look at a case study. And for each of the sections that we talk about in the evaluation plan, especially the sections that are really like the heart of the content of the plan, sections three through six, we're going to go to a case study to try to really make it real and to show you kind of what a real organization would do in terms of what they would write in their plan for this section. So the case study that we're going to talk about um, is a made-up organization. We're going to call it Healthy Youth. And I apologize, I wasn't feeling more creative when I wrote this case study. I didn't come up with a better name for you. But Healthy Youth is just a fictional organization, a youth center that does health education programs for teens, 12 to 18 year olds. And one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we walk through kind of the application of these, these content areas is that they're a new program. They've only been around for two years, and they're just about to conduct their first evaluation. And that's important when you look at what they've chosen to do and how they've made those choices is definitely a reflection of who they are as an organization and where they are at in their kind of developmental process in terms of their programming being fairly young. So let's look at the engaging stakeholders section and the case study around what they would write in their evaluation plan. On the right of your screen, you can see you know, a sort of a mock-up of what a written evaluation plan would look like. And then on the left, just a couple of excerpts of things that they might be including in their evaluation plan. And the stuff that you're seeing on the left is not the whole of this section of their evaluation plan. It's just sort of an excerpt. So when they wrote about engaging their stakeholders, the first thing that they did was come up with a list of who they consider their stakeholders. And as you can see, they have a pretty broad range of people that they identified as stakeholders, everyone from funders and board members to clients and program staff and program directors. And as a youth development program, it was really important to them, to healthy youth, to have broad participation in their evaluation process. So they really did include a very broad cross-section of folks who have an interest in their program. You can see that they identified their program director, Maria F., to be their evaluation coordinator. They have their staff, uh, who's a youth counselor, doing a lot of the data collection. They've solicited a number of youth, of youth who are their clients or their participants to be in an advisory board as well as to be in some, some focus groups, some participant focus groups, to give them input on developing the evaluation and implementing it. And then they have a board member and a funder who they want to engage in both the initial planning for the evaluation, and they're acknowledging that those are the people who are also going to be receiving results from the evaluation. 
So after they've listed out who their stakeholders are, then they would go on to say a little bit more about how they're going to engage those stakeholders. So for example, they might write about conducting focus groups with the youth to solicit the participants' feedback on the evaluation. They might write about meeting with their project officer, their funder, or their board member individually to solicit those people's feedback. So this section really identifies not just the people in their roles, but really specifically how they're going to engage with these participants, what activities they're going to do to solicit input from their stakeholders. So again, what's written on the left is just kind of an excerpt of what they would be putting in their evaluation plan. And this section is really going to be as long as they need it to be to kind of cover the information and the questions that they want to address. As you can see in the example on the right, it's like about half a page. They wrote sort of two and a half or three paragraphs about how they're going to engage their stakeholders. So I'd like to hear a little bit from you again about what you're doing to engage your stakeholders. So again, we're going to use the questions feature on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And if you can just write in a little bit what it is that you do to involve people in your evaluation processes. So who do you involve? And how are they involved in your evaluation? And not with any names attached. We don't want to know who by name, but just the type of people. Are you involving your clients, your participants, your board members, your community members? Is it really just your evaluation staff who's doing it? There's no right or wrong answers, but we would love for you all to share with each other and with us a little bit what you're doing in terms of engaging stakeholders in your organization. So while you chat that in, in the questions box on the bottom right hand of your tools, I'm going to talk a little bit about the next section. So as you can see, we're kind of right here in the middle, in the heart of the content of our evaluation plan. So after we've sort of identified and engaged our stakeholders, the next thing that we do is really focus the evaluation. And again, this is um, one of the steps of the CDC's framework of program evaluation. This is actually their step three. And focusing the evaluation is really kind of about the macro macro questions of evaluation. It's kind of the, the frame and the lens through which all the rest of your evaluation kind of falls into place. So being able to complete this section of the evaluation plan actually does require some background in evaluation. And as you hear me talking through some of the questions that are going to be answered in this section, you might hear language that you may or may not know, and maybe terms and words that you're familiar with or not. One of the resources that we're going to give you at the end of this webinar is what we call an evaluation glossary. It's basically just a document that contains kind of brief definitions of a lot of this kind of language. So don't let it intimidate you if you don't know it. Um, hopefully, if you do know it, you're not bored by the level of this webinar. But, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the macro questions that you're going to address in this section around focusing the evaluation. So first, the first section is around the type of evaluation that you're going to use. So this could be whether it's a process evaluation or an outcome evaluation, or whether you want to be doing cost-benefit analysis. And the type of evaluation you choose really has everything to do with what you're trying to learn and also the kind of stage of development of your organization, of your program. Really new programs often aren't ready for outcomes evaluation. Um, newer programs might be more interested in the process evaluation questions or the kind of process evaluation lens. If you're really looking to demonstrate that your program has results because you're about to scale it up to 16 other states, you might really need to be doing outcomes evaluation in order to kind of have the level of evidence that you need to make that decision. So the type of evaluation, process evaluation, outcome evaluation, cost effectiveness evaluation, there's lots of different types of evaluation. And you're not limited to just one. But this is the area where you might talk a little bit about what type of evaluation makes the most sense for your program and why you're making that choice. The next bullet point, the approach to evaluation, this is really almost more your philosophy of evaluation or your paradigm about evaluation. And here you'd want to write a little bit about, is this going to be a conventional evaluation, a participatory evaluation, an empowerment evaluation? Again, these are all words and terms that um, may be familiar or not to people. And again, I'll reference you to the evaluation glossary. We'll give you a link to that at the end of the webinar today. But your approach to evaluation really frames, both for your reader and for you as you're developing kind of your specific methods, what the philosophy is behind how you're going to do this evaluation work. If it's a conventional evaluation, you might be using an outside evaluator to do most of the work. If it's an empowerment evaluation, the goal is really around the skill and capacity building among participants. 
And so they might be doing most of your evaluation activities or methods. So thinking about the type of evaluation and the evaluation approach before you get into the even more specific question, which is about evaluation design. That's the third bullet point on the screen right now. So evaluation design is really referring to kind of what level of design is going to be appropriate given your available resources, given the level of evidence or rigor that you need for your evaluation. Are you going to do an experimental design and identify a control group? That's what a lot of research does, what researchers use, like a randomized controlled trial design. Or maybe you'll be doing a non-experimental design where you have no control group, no comparison group, or something in the middle, something we might call a quasi-experimental design where you have a comparison group, but it's not randomly assigned. So again, those three, the type of evaluation, the approach, and the design, those are really the macro questions, the kind of macro lens around your evaluation. And the last piece is where we really get to kind of the focus, I think, the focus of the evaluation. And that's really the specific evaluation questions that you're trying to answer through this evaluation, through this evaluation plan. And so some of your evaluation questions might come from your program's current objectives. You could be evaluating all of your program objectives or just some of them. Or you might want to come up with some new evaluation questions other than what your program objectives are. And so you can really see that this does relate to those macro questions above. So for example, if you were doing largely a process evaluation, you might have a process objective that you'd written you know, in your grant application or when you were developing the program that might be something about how many people you were going to reach. So you might have a program objective, a process objective, that you were going to reach 100 people through your program this year. And so one of your process evaluation questions based on that objective might be, how many people did you reach in your programs this year? Same thing if you're doing an outcome evaluation or if you have outcome objectives that you've developed for your program. Let's say just theoretically that you developed an objective around you want your participants to be developing communication skills. And so one of your outcome objectives is that they have an increase in their communication skills. So your outcome evaluation question might be sort of what communication skills have they developed or how much have they improved in their communication skills as a result of being in your program. So you can see that this last piece, the evaluation questions, it really flows from the bigger macro decisions you've made about the type of evaluation or the approach or the design and so um, it really gets kind of filtered through some of those larger questions before you can really define what the specific questions are. You have to think about what kind of evaluation it is you're going to be doing. So let's go back to our case study to try to make this a little bit more real. Again, remember Healthy Youth Program, um, our youth center for teens, two years old, doing their first evaluation. So here's an example of what they might include in the focusing the evaluation section of their written plan. On the right, again, you see that it's sort of a larger section. This is just a little bit of an extracted example. But because they are a newer program, only two years old, and it's their first evaluation, they're doing a combination of both process and outcome evaluation, but they're really focusing on the process piece because they're at a stage where they still really need to learn kind of what's working in the logistics of their programs and they're not necessarily ready to measure a lot of outcomes yet. But they're doing a little bit of a mixture of both. In terms of the approach, the, because they are a youth empowerment program, they're choosing to use a lot of participatory evaluation methods. But they're also including some conventional methods. So again, it's not always one or the other. It can be really a mix of approaches or a mix of types of evaluation also. So in their case, they're doing um, measuring some school performance indicators. And they're going to have an outside evaluator kind of develop those and, and measure those pieces of their outcomes for them. And so that's the more conventional approach. And the participatory approach is the stuff that they're going to actually engage their youth in doing the community surveying or doing a skills demonstration in their youth program. So that'll be the piece that's participatory and about developing their youth client skills. So mixture of different types, mixture of different approaches. In terms of their evaluation design, because they're a small community program, they decided that they didn't want to and they really didn't have the ability to do an experimental design like a randomized controlled trial. And also, they're primarily implementing evidence-based interventions. And so the evidence about the programs is already very strong. The researchers have already kind of developed the evidence, so they don't feel the need to duplicate or replicate that effort. So because of this, they decided that they wanted to do a quasi-experimental design. And they're actually going to do what's called a waitlist design. So they're going to use the youth who are waiting to get into their programs as a 
comparison group for the youth who are in their programs. So it's not a control group, it's not a randomized control, but it is a group of folks who are in the program and a group of folks who are not in the program. And that will allow them to make a little bit more of a claim about the program being the cause of the changes or the outcomes that they see. And finally, in terms of their evaluation questions, and this is just one of their questions, you would see on the right they have a sort of larger focusing the evaluation section that they've written up in their plan. But they're choosing to evaluate four of their original program objectives and creating three additional questions. And we have a full case study with all of these examples in the material that we're going to give you at the end of the webinar today. So just as an example, one of their process objectives for the program, and this is sort of the example we talked about in the last slide as well, is that during the school year from September through June, at least 100 youth ages 12 through 18 will participate in healthy youth programs. So that's the process objective that they developed for you know, writing their grant application, for example. And the corresponding evaluation question that they developed based on that objective was, how many youth have participated in our different healthy youth programs this year? So um, I'll just add that having written um, SMART objectives for a program really helps when you get to this stage of defining the evaluation questions, because that's a resource that you can draw on as you're developing the questions themselves. So let's go back to the evaluation plan section. So here we are. We're on gathering credible evidence, which is section one, two, three, four, five of our nine sections. But it's really kind of the, the third of the four that are really the heart of the content of the evaluation plan. So this section is also kind of the how. So now that we've thought about the macro issues of what kind of evaluation we're going to be doing, and we've specifically defined our evaluation questions, now we have to figure out how we're going to get that information, how we're going to gather what the CDC calls credible evidence. And this is a place where actually often programs will jump right in to the evaluation process. And I think we've all probably had the experience of realizing at the last minute that we need some kind of information or we need some kind of evaluation or there's something we need to know or learn or report on. And it's really easy to just move straight into let's design a survey, let's do some interviews, let's gather some data. But as you can see, when we go back to the CDC's framework, when we jump in at that stage, when we just develop a survey or develop an interview tool because there's something we need, we've kind of missed the first three steps around engaging stakeholders, describing the program, focusing our evaluation. And as we just saw in the last few sections, we really do have to think about those macro questions of, of kind of our type of evaluation, our approach to evaluation, our evaluation questions before we're ready to really determine what methods are the most appropriate. So one of the other benefits about doing an evaluation plan is that it can really help us to think through those first three steps before we get to the CDC's step four, or our section five, which is gathering credible evidence. So also just to say that this is a way that um, we kind of miss the opportunity to be more systematic. So if we think back to that Michael Quintatton definition about the systematic collection of information. So developing an evaluation plan is really an opportunity to approach our whole evaluation experience more systematically, to really go through the process of engaging people, thinking about what the bigger macro issues are, focusing the evaluation, and then, then we get to section five, how to gather that evidence. So in section five, we're really concerned with the specific methods for data collection. So this could be qualitative methods or quantitative methods. Um, and again, we've got more information about kind of what those methods are, what those words mean in the evaluation glossary, which we'll share with you at the end. But um, it's a chance to really think about which kind of methods, qualitative or quantitative, which mixture, mixed methods is going to make the most sense for us in terms of answering our evaluation questions and in terms of what the best alignment is with kind of our approach to evaluation, if it's participatory, if it's um, more conventional, if it's a... Um, a process evaluation or outcome evaluation, that really informs our selection of methods as well. So this is where we would think through, do we want to be doing focus groups or surveys or observations or reviewing documents or some combination of all of those things? What makes the most sense given the macro decisions we've made about the evaluation type and approach and design? And then you'd want to really include what the specific data sources or instruments are going to be. Are you doing pre and post tests? Are you doing written surveys? Are you doing uh, telephone interviews? Are you doing interactive games? Are you collecting data from standardized forms or databases that you already have or information that you've already gathered in some other way and you're just 
revealing that in order to answer your evaluation questions. And then, of course, you have to be really specific about who's going to do what, when, and where. And we're going to come back to that in one of our last sections, which is about developing a work plan. And the work plan is really the kind of who, what, when, and where of all of our evaluation activities. So let's take another look at our case study, try to keep this real again for us. So remember, Healthy Youth Program um, is focusing largely on their process, uh, process evaluation. And so you'd want to create something. Um, they're doing this. In our case study, we're using a table format. But you could use text paragraphs or bulleted text. You can use whatever kind of written format makes the most sense for you in your program and what you're the most comfortable with. But as you can see here, it's an example of just kind of the top title header and then one example. So how many youth have participated in their programs? That's their evaluation question. They're going to do a document review. That's their method. And their actual data source is the sign-in or attendance sheets for each of their program activities. They have a timeline that they're going to compile this every month, and their program staff are going to enter this data into their kind of database or their Excel file that's going to be capturing all of it. So that's how they would approach the gathering credible evidence section of their plan. And again, you'd want to do something like this basically for every method that you're going to be using or for every one of your evaluation questions. So as you can see on the bottom right, this is just a little excerpt of what would be a larger section of their evaluation plan. In fact, as large a section as they need based on what they're trying to learn in their evaluation. So another example might be for an outcome objective, because this one you see on the screen is a process objective. So if they had an outcome objective, the example we used before was about communication skills. So their question might be, what types of communication skills have youth developed in our program? Their method might be a skill demonstration or a role play or an observation. And their instrument might be like a standardized checklist that somebody, the person observing them, would use to assess the communication skills that they demonstrate. Things maybe like, did they use I statements? Did they try a variety of ways to communicate? Did they use nonverbal and verbal communication? So you could develop a standardized checklist. That would be your data source or instrument. And in this example, that might be something they would do at the end of their program or at the end of the program year. And the, the who would probably be the program staff or the program facilitator who would actually be facilitating that activity in their group. So let's do another little quick poll. I know folks do all kinds of evaluation methods in their programs, but one of the things that I want to encourage is that this is an opportunity to develop some new methods or to push yourself a little bit. When you're developing your plan, you can kind of expand what it is you want to be doing. So I want to know a little bit, what kinds of methods would you like to use more of? And again, this is a select all. So do you want to do more interviews or more surveys or more participatory activities? Do you want to use more, do more using existing data or do more focus groups? So give us your thoughts. Again, just going to give you a couple of seconds to poll in. And maybe while folks are doing that, also if there are questions that are coming up, feel free to type them in the question box. I can make sure to address them. Or if it's something you want to ask out loud, you can click on the raise the hand icon, and we could take some questions as well. Let's go ahead and close out the poll, see what folks would like to do more of. Excellent. People after my own heart, participatory activities by a whopping 92%. Um, folks like these more focus groups as well. It looks like people maybe are doing interviews and surveys as much as they want or using existing data as much as they want, but that's great. Again, we'll have more resources around all of these specific methods at the end of the webinar when we um, link you to some other resources both that we've developed and that other folks have developed around evaluation. So let's go back, talking about kind of the last section in the heart of our evaluation plan. So the last section in the heart of our plan is about justifying conclusions. And this is really the so what of our eval talk definition, the what, so what, now what. The how do we make sense of what it is that we've learned? And in this section, we want to think about who's going to be involved in interpreting data. So is it just going to be the evaluator who's going to be analyzing it or interpreting it, making sense of it? Or do we need to involve other people in order to really understand what it is that the data shows? Do we need to involve our clients or our staff or our community members? So really the question is not just who's going to be involved, but who needs to be involved in order to understand what these things mean. 
Also, what do we need to think about in terms of the context of the program or community in order to make sense of the data? And this is my favorite example. People ask me all the time about how, um, what it, what, how do we define success numerically? So what is a success rate? And the example I always like to give is um, if I told you that a certain program had a 12% success rate, so 12% of their participants achieved whatever the defined outcome of the program was, what would you think? Is that a successful program? Is 12% a success rate? And my answer is, it depends on the context. So if that was a smoking cessation program, that would be a fantastically, phenomenally successful program. Nationally, on average, tobacco cessation programs have a success rate of about 8%. That means six months after the program, about 8% of participants have stopped smoking, which is the defined outcome of tobacco cessation programs. So if the average is 8% success, and you have a 12% success rate, that is a phenomenally successful program. On the other hand, if that 12% success rate was from a driver education program, for example, and only 12% of the people who went through your program were able to successfully get a driver's license after completing your program, you probably have some significant problems with your program. And it's probably not a program that you want to be replicating or growing until you work some of that out. So understanding the context of a program and understanding maybe what the standards of success are for this type of program or within your community. It, it's really important in terms of how we analyze our findings, how we make sense of this data that we've just gathered through all these methods that we've just done in the last section. So thinking about who's involved, who do we need involved in order to understand what it means, and what do we need to know about the context of the program or the community or the types of programs, how we define success. What do we need to know about the context in order to make sense of it? You also probably want to include in this section something about your quality assurance plan. So what is it that you're going to do to ensure that your data, as it's being entered, as it's being collected, is accurate? So you're putting all this work into collecting information. You want to make sure that it's actually accurate. So you might think about putting in here information about who's going to check your data or how frequently, or quality assurance around confidentiality. How are you going to store this data? How are you going to ensure that your participants and your clients' information is being protected? And finally, a timeline for maybe the quality assurance or timeline for the analysis. Again, we'll come back to that when we talk about the work plan section. So one last look at our case study for the Healthy Youth Program and for that example that we were using about their process objective of how many youth are in their programs. They were looking at their attendance sheets. So the data source or instrument is the youth sign-in sheets. The quality assurance activity, they're going to do some checks for accuracy. So staff are doing the data entry, but the program manager is going to check every fourth sheet. That's how they're going to ensure they have some accuracy in their data entry. In terms of confidentiality, they're going to write a little bit in this section of their evaluation plan about where they're storing their data. In a locked filing cabinet, who has the key, how electronic files are password protected. And they're also going to put some information in in terms of their timeline. So the program manager is going to do monthly analysis and share that with staff at their staff meeting. And that's part of getting staff input. So that's part of the who is going to be involved. They're going to compare the attendance records with records of other programs, as well as last year's attendance, in order to have a sense of context. Is 50% attendance good for this community or this type of program or not good? So that's how they're going to get some of that information about context. And then finally, they're actually going to involve an outside evaluator to provide some oversight for them. This kind of goes back to their plan about doing sort of a mixed approach, both participatory and conventional, in terms of their evaluation activities. So the I want to hear a little bit from you. This is the last question I'm going to ask you guys to write in about. But I think this question of context is really challenging for people. So I would love to hear some of your successes, things that you're doing, in order to use the context to help you understand what your data means. So who's involved in interpreting your data? That can be a piece of your context. Or do you, does anybody compare your data to other programs or to standards in the community? Again, no right or wrong answers. This is just a chance for us to kind of learn together from each other and from your best practices. So while you write in about that, I'm going to go ahead and finish up this section for us. So this is really the heart of the content of your evaluation activities. And again, these four sections should really be as long as they need to be in order to answer the evaluation questions. Um, so your introduction was short, your program description was short. These four sections are really as long as you need them to be. And then you're moving on to what I consider probably the most important thing of the evaluation plan, which is how to use your results. 
And again, if you think back to that eval talk definition, the what, the what, now what, this is the now what. So we did all this work, we learned all this stuff, now what? What are we going to do with it? How are we going to improve our programs? Who are we going to share that information with? And that's what this section, section seven, is really all about. So in terms of thinking of your of sharing results with your stakeholders, this really takes us right back to that very first step about engaging our stakeholders. And we want to, again, define who our stakeholders are. Hopefully we define that as broadly as possible. And who are we sharing the results with? Is it our clients, our participants, the community, our funders? And what are we sharing? Are we sharing the same thing with everybody? Are we sharing everything with everyone? Or are there certain pieces that we really want to emphasize with our funders and other pieces that we really want to emphasize in the community? So decisions about what to share and with whom and how. How are we going to share that? We might want to write a report. That might be how we share it with a funder. We might want to put together a press release. That might be how we share with the community. We might want to create an activity or a celebration that we share some of those results with some of our participants or our clients. But different methods are going to be more appropriate for different groups of people and for different kinds of results that we're trying to share. So thinking about what we're sharing, who, and how. And also, what are the systems by which we're going to use that information to improve our programs? And specifically, how is that decision making going to happen? Who is going to be involved in making those decisions? Are we, is it the program manager who's uh, reviewing the data and making revisions to the program? Is it a participatory process whereby we're getting input from community members or funders or clients or other staff and having some more participatory process around using the evaluation results to improve our program? Let's go back one quick last look at our evaluation case study. So again, our youth program as a really uh, youth development program is very invested in this kind of participatory model. And so they write a little bit about planning to share the results with multiple stakeholders. Um, again, this is just one sentence on the left that's extracted from the larger section on the right, which you'll see is about you know, half a page or something. And so if they're planning to do some different things, they're going to write a written report that they're going to share with their board of directors. They're going to have an end of the school year party with their youth, their clients, in order to share some of the evaluation results with their participants. And then in terms of their process around making improvements to the program, they're going to ask each group of stakeholders to offer practical suggestions for improving the program. And then the program manager and the staff are going to use the summer, which is a break in terms of their school year programming. They'll use the summer to really revamp the program and make changes based on what they learned from this evaluation before they start the next cycle of program in the next school year. So that's an example from the case study of what that section of the evaluation plan might look like. And finally, we're at the very tail end, the last two pieces, the work plan and the appendix. This is really just tying it all together at the very end. The work plan, like I said a few times, is the kind of who's going to do what by when. Um, it's very much like the table that we saw in a couple of the earlier steps in the case study that they've been using a table to identify their methods and their analysis plan. So the work plan is really just a big table. It lays out every specific evaluation task who's doing it, and when it's going to happen. And we have a Word document that is an evaluation plan template that we'll be sharing with you at the end of this presentation. And you can actually take that Word document and type in your own activities, your own timeline, your own you know, identification of who's responsible. But here's a couple examples, things from hiring the evaluation coordinator to having meetings to engage their stakeholders and get input on the evaluation, developing the questions, the evaluation questions, um, and then developing you know, their client satisfaction survey or their interview tool or their staff survey. And then what you don't see here, the work plan really has sections for every one of those steps, from engaging stakeholders to focusing evaluation, gathering evidence, doing the analysis, as well as sharing those findings and improving the program as a result of it. So you don't see the full work plan here. You just see the first few sections of it. And then finally, the very last section you'll probably want in your comprehensive written evaluation plan is some appendices. Now, appendices aren't necessarily required. They're often optional in documents. But it is a really good opportunity to include things that might be a little bit too lengthy to include in kind of the main evaluation plan. So some of your longer tables or charts you might want to include in the appendix. You might want to include copies of the actual evaluation instruments, such as a survey or an interview guide. Or if you're doing participatory activities, you might want to include a copy of that in the appendix. You could also include your program's logic model or other descriptive material, things 
not that you're creating for your evaluation plan, but things that you might have in your grant application or in some other program description documents, things that you might want to write about a little bit in that early section, the program description section, but you might want to put kind of the bulkier piece of it into the appendix. And as you can imagine, some of these documents really help to kind of create the more full picture of the evaluation and what you're going to be doing in terms of your evaluation plan. So that is really all the content of the evaluation plan. Just again, in summary, you have sort of a brief introduction, a brief description of your program, which hopefully you're largely able to pull from other places. And then these four sections that are really the heart of your activities, how you're engaging people, the kind of macro questions of focusing the evaluation, what your methods are, how you're going to collect the information, and how you're going to make sense of it, and then what you're going to do with that, which really is the, the heart and soul of why we do evaluation is in order to do what we do better. And then the work plan and the appendix kind of hold it all together and give us a task list so we can keep ourselves on task as we do it. So finally, now that we know what goes in the plan, who is going to be involved in creating the plan? And again, I'm sure you've heard a theme as I've been talking a lot today about participation. We really encourage folks to think about a multidisciplinary team and a multidisciplinary approach to developing the plan. It's really a great way to get input from a wide variety of stakeholders who, who are invested in your program and in its success and in it being as best, you know, the best that it can be, not to be cheesy with that. Um, and also, developing the evaluation plan collaboratively is a great opportunity to kind of increase buy-in across a wide variety of participants. And that'll really help to make sure the plan gets implemented in the full way in which it's written. So that's the end of the content of today's webinar. We have just a few minutes left for some of your questions. I'd also love to hear from you, and I'd love you to hear from each other. If there's anything that has really struck you in today's webinar that you're going to take away with you and that's going to help you to change or improve the way you're doing evaluation planning in your organization. So again, you can use that question box to write in a question if there's something specific you'd like me to answer for you. You can share a bright idea of something you're going to do differently, something that really sparks your interest. If you have a question you want to ask live, you can also click on that hand icon, raise your hand to ask a question, and I'd be more than happy to entertain any of your questions. As you're coming up with your questions, I'm going to close out by just talking a little bit about some of our additional resources. Um, as I've said a few times, we have an information sheet, which is really like a summary of all the content of today's webinar, all the different questions and all the different areas for an evaluation plan. We also have a Word document, which is what we call a template, which you can actually use and adapt for developing your organization's evaluation plan. I referenced a few times this evaluation glossary, which is just brief definitions of a lot of the terms that I've used, qualitative and quantitative methods, or conventional and participatory and empowerment evaluation, or quasi-experimental and experimental design. Just gives a little bit more information about some of those terms. We also have um, some materials around sharing evaluation findings with suggestions for specific kinds of activities that you can do to share your findings. So all of those resources are available on our website at the link that you see in orange just below them. We also have a number of other webinars that we've developed around evaluation, and those are also on our website. So these slides, this recorded version of the webinar, as well as the slides that will be up on our website, um, along with links to all of these uh, different materials and resources. And finally, I just want to say a little bit about the individual capacity building assistances services that we can provide. So as I said at the beginning, we're funded by CDC to provide these services for free to community-based organizations. And that is my direct number and direct email. So I'd be happy to give folks more information about the other kinds of more individualized capacity building assistances that we can provide. So I'm wondering if anybody has any questions. I'm seeing some great um, sharing of things that you're learning and things that you're going to take away from this webinar. And I really want to say thank you for sharing all that. I think it's important to hear from everybody's voices, not just to hear mine. But we do have a couple minutes if there's any questions. Feel free to click your hand icon or write in a question.
I'm not seeing any questions come in. I'm going to stay on the line for a little while, but I will go ahead and just close out the webinar by saying thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I really hope that you go out and continue the conversation about how to make your evaluation processes richer and more systematic. So please stay on the line. If you would like to ask a question live, you can click your hand icon and ask it out loud. Or if you'd like to type it in, I will stay on the line. But that does conclude the content of today's webinar. Thank you so much.